they were referring to it as Full Metal Jacket at Juilliard. Well, the drums are loud. He's shouting, that's loud. That kind of works out. Yeah. I don't necessarily differentiate between music or dialogue or birds chirping. Hey, this is Kim Kyland back with another Ursa exclusive. Today we're here at True Audio in Burbank, California with Tom Curley. Hi. Hello. Tom sound mixed a film called Whiplash that we're going to talk about today. A sound mixer for nearly two decades, Tom has been a member of IATSE Local 695 since 2003. In 2008, he was inducted into the Cinema Audio Society and then into the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in 2015. In addition to his Oscar and BAFTA wins for Whiplash, Tom continues to build a name for himself in the industry, with credits on films like The Spectacular Now, A Million Little Pieces, and the hit Paramount television show Yellowstone. Join us as we go behind the scene on one of the most exciting films of the last decade with Thomas Curley. So let's talk a little bit about how you got into this project, um, All right. how you came on board in the first place. Um, yeah, so. My initial connection to this was through the assistant director, Nick Harvard. Mm -hmm. um, I worked with him and Miles Teller on uh, The Spectacular Now about a year and a half earlier. It's a great film. And um, so we had a rapport. Uh, Nick Harvard's an awesome AD. Mm -hmm. We're good friends. And he called me up one day and said, hey, Tom, how'd you like to do a movie with no budget, no schedule that's going to be really hard for sound, and I said, you know, let's take a look. <laughs> and uh, they sent me the script, and I don't think I've ever read a script faster. Wow. Um, Whiplash is an insanely intense story, mm -hmm. and right from the start, I was just turning pages like crazy, yeah. and I couldn't call them back fast enough and say, what do I have to do to work on this? And um, they set me up with an interview with Damien Chazelle, and we talked about film school, and we talked about the philosophy of sound and film mm. making, and how we might accomplish this movie. Because he, he was um, fresh off of his short winning the Sundance Festival. Oh, that's right. And they did that with pure playback. Oh. And what he didn't like was that it was like, you'd have your scene, and then once the playback started, it kind of sounded like you just hit play on a CD. Mm -hmm. and it lost all of the tonal qualities of the, the room, room and yeah. everything. Five, six, seven. So what we worked out, something that I've not really had happen before or since is we had multiple meetings mm. in pre-production about how to do this the best way, That's great. how to integrate with the camera, um, how to work with the actors, yeah. how to, you know, what editing is going to be expecting. Um, they were already pre-recording tracks for okay. this to, uh, to play back on set. Who was and, in these early meetings, may I ask? The uh, DP, producer, editor, ADs, Damien, myself. Um, I think that's about it. Great. Okay. Yeah. So, and they were already in the studio pre-recording a lot of the music that they yeah. were going to use. Okay. And they were always planning on having playback on set. Okay. Um, and to that end, what Damien had done was all the actors that we see in the band, mm -hmm. they're all real musicians. They all know those instruments mm -hmm. specifically, you know. And so they gave them all the charts ahead of time and they were to learn how to play them note for note. And when we got on set, they would actually do that. Mm -hmm. But we didn't record their playing for the purposes of using in the movie. The reason that we don't have any microphones in there is it's a classroom. And there's no architecture or set pieces that mm -hmm. would allow us to properly mic this room. Mm. Um, which is actually not even a room. This is a set that was built on the stage of the uh, Orpheum Theater, I think, in downtown. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no ceiling. This goes straight up into the into the theater uh, wings. Oh, wow. You know, yeah. um, this is the basement of that theater. Yeah. It, it has a very basementy feel. Like the yeah. ceiling feels very low down and closed in on you. And um, this scene was the first 
scene where I was starting to get comfortable with not having anybody wired. Mm -hmm. um, they did this little walk and talk, and that was all on a Shep's uh, 41. Andrew. Parents musicians? No. What do they do? My uh, dad's a, a writer. Oh, what's he written? Uh, I guess he's, he's more of a teacher, really. Um, and why didn't you have anyone wired? Um, well, uh, JK d didn't want to be wired, mm. ever. We wired him two times in this whole movie. That was actually one of the questions I had when I was watching this, was he's always got this tight black t-shirt on, yeah. but I never saw anything through yeah. his t-shirt. So I was like, well, they did a great job in wiring him. Nope. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for a reason. Have fun. The set that, that we're about to see there, it, it's literally just four set walls. There's no ceiling. Mm. Um, the things that you see hanging down are uh, suspended from cables. Mm. And okay. um, they lit through the, you know, through the ceiling yeah. and we boomed over the, over the set walls. Okay, so you had a little bit of space that way. Yeah. That's really nice. So the musicians were all playing live instruments. They weren't mic'd because there was, you know, we could put yeah. mics in the room, we could hide mics in the room, but not in a way that would allow us to record everything properly. To make it sound natural. Yeah. Right. So Damien had all these different tempos pre-planned. Yeah. Um, it wasn't in the script per se, but it was in his mm. head. Um, between every scene, they uh, they would have different tempos for mm. for different parts of this shot, um, loading up different um, Pro Tools sessions okay. on the fly as we were doing different scenes because right. each of these have different time signatures. And when you see J.K. Simmons doing the uh, the little finger move that he right, does, yeah. that's that's an edit point. But right. when he does that little the conducting, yeah. Yes. Um, during that moment on set, there was a voice playing through playback that mm -hmm. was the time signature saying mm -hmm. one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four. Whose voice was that? In the it recording? was the composer. It was, okay. And, J Justin, um, Justin Hurwitz. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he um, laid that on to every single track mm -hmm. and we would play that back there were four counts of it, I think, mm -hmm. on each playback, and he would do this throughout all four counts, yeah. and then on the last one, it was mute, and he w and we would get that, and then the, everything would start playing. Oh, wow! And um, we, uh, un what we worked out with Damien was that we would have the boom open the whole time, uh -huh. and um, that allowed us to get more of the reverb mm. and also all of the players and stuff doing their little finger movements and yeah, yeah. Uh, valves and such yeah. on the saxophones. And whenever they finish, they put everything down and the drumsticks go down. Right, and you can and hear, so you all, hear that. all that stuff. Yeah, and awesome. it made it much more of an immersive playback experience. But then, so because you have a combination of a lot of very loud instruments, like you yeah. have a lot of brass and woodwind and then you have drums, obviously, mm -hmm you're probably having to ride those levels pretty hard or, or just kind of... Um, well, th that's the thing is with this playback stuff, mm -hmm. we weren't recording for the purposes of using that recording. Right, but they were still playing to right. give that, that illusion of being real. Yeah. So was that a problem ever? Like just, you know, in terms of like, l even just listening to the boom for your boom ops or for yourself? So we had to have him actually hitting cymbals and actually hitting drums while Fletcher was shouting at him yeah, and all that and stuff. Yeah, slapping him right. and all that, yeah. And so everybody was very worried that the drums were just going to completely ruin mm. that. And basically the conversation that we had was, well, the drums are loud. He's shouting. That's loud. That kind of works out. Yeah. And we don't really have many other options. Mm. So we're going to do it live. We're going to make it the best that we can. Yeah. And then you're gonna evaluate later on whether or not that's good for the movie or not. Yeah. And it was. Oh, that's great. You know, uh, the worst case scenario was that we loop that. Totally. Of him shouting, but in at 
at the end of the day, uh, I think they told me they looped six lines and three of those were for dialogue changes. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's great. Damien was very attentive uh, on the actors, making mm. sure that they were all proper. That's great. Um, and yeah. that, that was really important to him. Um, that not only was everything musically and technically proper, mm -hmm. but, but also that it, it made sense in the scene. Absolutely. You know? I, I'm not a musician, so mm -hmm. I didn't have any of that stuff uh, to, to reference. Mm -hmm. I was just worried about making a technically good recording, yep. um, which is something that I don't necessarily differentiate between music or dialogue or birds chirping or yep. cars driving by. It's a good recording. Um, I agree. And uh, so that, that was um, that was mostly my focus was just trying to make sure that that everything was uh, pristine. Yeah. Because um, we didn't have we didn't have the money to fix things, and we didn't have the time to fix things. This was a 19-day shoot. Wow. Total. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. I think there was like a B-roll day in New York City. Um, <sighs> But, yeah, that's a tight schedule for a feature. Well, not only that, but we shot this in September uh -huh. of 2013, and January of 2014, it was opening Sundance. Oh, wow. As a finished So the post-production schedule is really Super tight quick. as well. Wow. Yeah. Another thing about this set in particular, um, and, and uh, uh, pretty much all, I think all the sets where music was being played, Craig mm -hmm. Mann and, um, would come out to the set and he had a, uh, I can't remember the name of the software at the time, but it was an incidence response sweep. Um, he would uh, mm. he would put a speaker out on the set mm -hmm. and then set up four microphones and it would play this like uh, frequency sweep. And oh. it's, uh, what, what, and then the microphones all record the reverb and it, it makes like a scene accurate reverb model. Oh my gosh, that's to, cool. To apply to the, to the um, you know, playback music and all that stuff. I want to ask too before we before we proceed in this scene. I I, yeah. I can't stop thinking about the fact that J.K. didn't want to be wired. Right. What what was the deal with that? Um. Well, he was very intimidating, and I didn't. No, really. I didn't ask <laughs> why. Okay. <laughs> um, I respect that. <laughs> I just said okay. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that, then he threw a chair at your head. Yeah. Um. I mean that was. <laughs> He's a very nice person. Yeah. Um, he's a very funny person on comedies mm -hmm. and stuff. And my suspicion is that he was just deep in this character. Absolutely. And was trying to focus on that and didn't mm -hmm. want to be bothered with other things. I can understand. Um, that being said, we did uh, plead with him for two shots. Mm -hmm. um, one was the steady cam walk and talk where he's outside on the sidewalk mm -hmm. and there's like a guy playing bucket drums. Um, yeah. And the other scene was when he tells the classroom about uh, his former student that died. Um, that was a steady cam that started like in the very back corner of the room and you see everything and then it gets all the way into this tight close up of him. Yeah. But the truth was uh, he barely squeaked in to begin with and uh, he was really struggling. And, and it's um, very intimate, that yeah. scene. The most intimate for his character, yeah. I'd say, yeah. So uh, those were the only two shots that had a wire for JK. Um, yeah. We did wire Miles as needed. Cool. You know, but um, that that was uh, an unexpected challenge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I've had a few talent ask me or tell me yeah. that they're not going to be wired. And, you know, sometimes it's for, like, they just they don't want to be touched. They don't right. want their costume messed with. And that's always a challenge. Yeah, and but. and there's there's lots of um, you know logistical ways to mm -hmm. deal with that. I mean, yeah. um, I always sort of try and take a clinical approach to it, mm -hmm. and a uh, you know, and just tell them like, um, okay, well, if, if you don't want us to touch you, you mm -hmm. know, here's the thing: you can go and have your wardrobe people put it on right. for you, and we'll yeah. touch it up as needed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I I want. I always want actors to feel comfortable yeah. doing their performance, and Absolutely. and I, you know, would hate to be the one that's like, uh, uh, 
stumbling yeah, block for that. that. Yeah, mm, of course. Um, however, <laughs> I have a job to do. Yes. And at the end of the day, if the boom is not working for whatever reason, then yeah, that's that's our go-to for uh, for a backup. Um, Sometimes many? plant mics work too, though. Totally, so, yeah. Um, no, there's there's a lot of workarounds for this kind yeah. of stuff. If we can get good sound and not have to make anybody uncomfortable, that's a great day. Absolutely, I agree. Now, how many boom operators did you have on this set? On this, it was yep. one. One. Um, we had uh, David Stark was my boom operator. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Ohini was my utility. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a mixer now. And then we had uh, playback for the playback days. Cool. But the, we would not have had a playback person if it wasn't for um, Damien insisting on mm. our side of things being perfect. That's great. Because um, this was a three and a half million dollar budget too. Yeah. So every everything was on an as needed basis. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, it wasn't like a, we'd like to have this thing for this thing or right, any of that. It was like. We need this, or the movie doesn't happen. Yeah, you know. But that's great to have a director who, you know, wants to have these meetings to begin with. Yes. You know, wants to just make sure you have everything you need. Understands the importance of sound, especially yeah. in a in a film about music. Right. Sound is key. Yeah. I think this. I mean, I, I'm so excited to talk more about this <laughs> scene. So, all right. So he throws the chair, and then this scene gets progressively louder. Progressively more aggressive, more violent. Yes. What were some of the challenges you faced in, in this particular scene? The the saving grace for me on this was I was using a sound device, a 788T mm -hmm. and a CL9. Mm -hmm. And the CL9 had a gain knob right above the fader, mm. which is something that they did away with for these guys. Yeah. And um, so for the scenes where they're quiet, you know, I, I'd have it cranked as much as I could stand it. And uh, they had some kind of an algorithm on the within that function where mm. if you like jerked the knob real quick, it would bring it down real quick. Yeah. But if you just clicked it one at a time, it would go down subtly. Mm. And that was a really awesome function, and it made this scene like possible. possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Without without uh, any you know clipping issues. Absolutely. And things like that. One, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Rushing or dragging? Rushing. So you do know the difference. So the mics that I used in this. Oh, uh, yeah, let's talk about what gear you used in this. So, um, yeah, I recorded on a 788T with a CL9 control surface. Mm -hmm. um, everything was wireless, including the boom. Mm -hmm. uh, had a Sheps MK41. Mm -hmm and a CMIT, and then Sanken COS 11s for wires. And then I think I used a MKH 50 and a Sanken Cub 1 for plant mics as mm, well. Okay. I've talked to different mixers about the types of booms, boom mics they like to use yeah. and why, or when or where. Sure. Are you somebody who has like indoor and outdoor mics or, you know, mics that you're going to use in a, a louder situation? Like what, what determines which mic you're going to pull out? Right. Um, I've used all of my mics indoors and outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, I generally will try and use a CMIT or a longer mic for the wider shots and then try and move into a 50 or a 41 as we get closer. Um, unless there's some mitigating factor mm. that, that that mic can't be right here. Right. You know, um, okay. if, if we need distance, then I'll always go to the CMIT. Um, I used to have an 816 and I got rid of that because mm -hmm. um, any any shot where that's necessary is going to be a wire these yeah. days. Yeah. I use the CMIT a lot on J.K. Simmons because you wouldn't let us wire him. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we also tried to plant mics for him and things like that. And that we had, I don't think we were as successful with planting mics as we were with booming. Mm. Um, yeah, I can understand. Like, I, I do remember the 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 one that we did wire him for um where he was talking about his dead student um we put a plant mic on the music stand oh brilliant you would think <laughs> except 
when he comes in, he takes his jacket off, he goes to the music stand and starts shuffling papers and stacking them and banging them. And yeah, so fuck that mic, basically, yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so the, the CMIT was able to pull out oh, that's great. awesome dialogue. Yeah. From, I mean, th there were wide shots where that CMIT was literally hiding behind the ceiling elements. Oh, wow. You know? Yeah, but even with that that distance in the range, it was still getting what you needed in yeah. a certain, wow. Yeah, that's a mic I've wanted for a while, and you're, <laughs> you're really selling me on it right now. <laughs> they're, they're pretty awesome. Yeah, I've used them before booming for other people, but I, I'm quite fond of them already. Yeah, the other nice thing about it is like, if you really have to crank it on the gain, yeah. it doesn't have a lot of self noise. Mm, so it can handle, you know, being driven really hard. Right, cool. So for the final father fucking time, say it louder! I'm upset! Carl. Start practicing harder, Neiman. Whiplash, bar 125, big boy tempo. When we were on set, it, they were referring to it as Full Metal Jacket at Juilliard. So, <laughs> exactly. Um, and and that, that was, um, Damien told me that that line as well, and that really gave me the idea of like, okay, this is what we're doing, right? You know, yeah, and it kind of gives you that that feeling going in, that raw emotion behind that. Yes. Like this is this is meant to be visceral and painful, mm -hmm. and and the sound should reflect that and capture, mm -hmm. encapsulate that. Um, oof, yeah, that scene. <laughs> oof. Um, what, if, what about yeah? Should we move on to a, another like maybe like a softer scene? This point in the film is really interesting when you get to see a different side of his character. Yeah. You think things are going to go one way, mm -hmm. you know, you, he, he softens. There's a lot of memories that, yeah. that uh, are coming back from this scene too. This is not a real place. Oh no. Um, so mm. the theater row on Broadway, I can't remember which theater this is. It was not the Orpheum, but like the one down the street from there. We mm -hmm. shot at multiple different theaters on Broadway in LA. Yeah. Um, there's a big overhang where the marquee was and all that stuff, yeah. and and the sidewalk, and then the open street, and that's where this club was. They built double walls around the outside of it. Oh, it's for help with the noise. Yeah. Oh, thank um, God. Um, that was something that I, that was like the only money I asked them to spend in pre-production right. was to build a double wall for this set because there's literally just buses driving by outside. Which to me shows the importance of having the sound mixer or the sound team on a technical scout sure. because had they not known that or gotten that advice from you, you yeah. would have shown up on that day to shoot and, and they're like, this is going to sound bad. We have to close yeah. the street or we have to, you know, do ADR. Right. This was uh, also a day that we used earwigs. Um, oh. These three players here mm -hmm. all had earwigs in, and um, the, I think it was the the gentleman on the drum set mm -hmm. was like 150 years old, and he couldn't hear anything. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the earwigs didn't really work really for, him. Much for <laughs> yeah, him. Yeah. <laughs> But he just watched the other guys oh. and he started doing his thing when they yeah. started doing their thing and it worked okay. So were the earwigs but just feeding them tempo or music? No, it was the actual was. songs okay. that they were playing um, because, again, we did a we did sort of a one take with this, but then also yeah. um, when they're having their dialogue at the table, you mm -hmm. can still see them in the background playing. Yeah. Um, so it was really just to keep them accurate to yeah, what they were yeah, playing. Absolutely. Um, and not mess up our dialogue. That's great. Yeah, so th this was a, a much more intimate scene, but we still had to do a lot to make it sound good. Yeah. I don't know if you heard, uh, I'm not a Schaefer anymore. So for those of our audience who don't know the difference between production and post sound, yeah. um, this is a good scene to illustrate, I think. Sure. What do you record as a production sound mixer versus yeah. what is added in post in a scene like this car crash? Um, so what I recorded was uh, Miles shouting his lines on the phone call. Mm -hmm. Hey, tell Fletcher I'm coming. What the fuck is taking you so long, man? We're moving on stage right now. I know, I got locked in my car, it's fine. I got locked in my car, I'm coming. 
we had this car on a, a shot maker, which is like a, a tow yeah. rig, and the cameras are all on the on the truck. Uh, my sound gear is in the cab of the truck. Mm -hmm. We wire up the car um, with, uh, I think we had just a plant mic maybe in the visor mm -hmm. or clamped down near where the stick shift might be. Right. Um, and that shot right, right there. Right, up from the phone, yeah. That was um, done with the car stationary. And a green screen mm. was put up outside. And then they took a, another shot of the truck backing up. Mm. And they played that in reverse. Interesting. So they could get, they could start with the grill right up on the lens. Right. And they, you know, run that shot in reverse and it looks like the truck is coming at you. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, and uh, there were props or set deck people that mm -hmm. had all this glass here yep. as little clear pieces of silicone. Mm. And it, it has the shape, like the sharp edges of glass, but, but it's, it's squishy. Safe. Yeah. And it doesn't make any sound either. Right, so that so, sound would have to be added in post yes. when he's dragging himself um, through the glass. And so this is obviously um, a, another car that they mm -hmm. had messed up and placed upside down and okay? they put little smoke effects in there and stuff like that. Um, so like the car hissing and things like that, that would all be post-production sound. The actual crash itself is post-production sound. Yeah, really all, all we did for that shot was, was the dialogue. So yeah, when we wrapped, um, I think that was our only night shoot, mm -hmm. but we shot all night long and we wrapped the film at like 5.30 in the morning. And myself, the, uh, the sound crew, and a couple of the camera guys all went to this bar called The Drawing Room, which opens at 6 a.m. Oh, wow. And there were like eight people in there when we got there. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we had a celebratory <laughs> drink and, you know, went our separate ways. Yeah. And it was kind of like, oh, well, okay, cool. We did a good job. We made yeah. a cool little movie. And that's probably going to be it. And we'll just go on with the rest of our lives. But that did but not happen. But that's not what happened. Yeah. What, what did happen? Uh, well, um, <laughs> about three months later, we found out that, we're, that the film is not only going to be in Sundance, but opening the festival. And wow. so that was a big deal. Yeah. And uh, I was able to fortunately get one of the last tickets to that screening. Cool. And I went out and saw it uh, for the first time at Sundance. At Sundance, wow! With a thousand other people. That's so special. And it was like you could hear a pin drop mm. until the credits rolled, mm. and the whole place exploded like nothing I've ever seen. Wow! And I was like, "Wow, this is cool!" Like um, I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. You know, especially for something that I'd worked on. <laughs> and I found out that we were nominated for the BAFTAs which is in London, yeah. and I was thinking, that's cool, but I don't have enough money to fly to London. Yeah. So, but then a week later, Sony called me and told me that they're gonna give me a first class ticket to go. Oh my gosh. And so I got to fly first class to London, and sure enough, we won. And at that point, I was talking myself out of the prospect of winning because we were up against movies like um, Interstellar mm -hmm. and American Sniper. I mean, Interstellar was, craft services budget was more than the whole budget for Whiplash, I <laughs> yeah. think. And I, I, at the time, I thought like, well, okay, so that's probably what's gonna happen, but yeah. it didn't. So when, when the BAFTA happened, we were like, wow, okay, so this is like getting yeah. real. Yeah. And, um, and then the Oscars came and, and sure enough. <laughs> and the Oscar goes to Whiplash, Craig Mann. What was that like? Um, it's it's hard to describe. Have you ever jumped out of a plane? No. Okay. It's like that. It's kind of like that. Have you jumped out of a plane? Yeah. Ooh. Um, it's like um, time suspended. Yeah. yeah. Tunnel vision. Wow. Try not to like pass out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which is not something I do often, yeah, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but, but it's a uh, lot though. You you yeah. know already going in the, how many people are watching from yeah. home and how many people are there and who's there. And I'd been watching the Oscars since I was 
seven years old, yeah, maybe. You totally. Know, dreaming about Gosh. that moment. And, um, yeah, so it was pretty mind blowing. Yeah, oh, that's really cool. Thank you for sharing all of this. Oh, my pleasure. Insight and I mean, everything from the technical to the emotional. This was really fun. Sure. Uh, thank you guys for watching. We'll be back soon with more new episodes with more awesome mixers like Tom Curley. Thank you so much for watching this Ursa exclusive video. We'll be back with more in this series soon. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel so you get notifications when we release new videos. This is your host, Kim Kyland, signing off.